everybody. Today we're gonna to talk about interpersonal relationships, why they are important, why we need them, and how burnout can cause them to go wrong. As we know, when one part of our life is suffering, it can definitely cause a ripple effect and hurt those around us. It can even cause our healthy relationships to turn toxic. Now humans are social creatures. We thrive on relationships, connectivity, and intimacy. I only say that so you know that feeling lonely and wanting other people around sometimes is completely normal. We are hardwired for connection. If you have ever fed a baby a bottle, you would have seen how they make eye contact with you while they eat. It's part of how we as babies develop attachment. You know, we want connection and connecting is part of the human condition. However, when our mental health isn't doing well, it's very common that our relationships will suffer too. Some even become toxic because of it. Today, we're gonna to talk about the signs that your mental health is affecting your relationships, as well as how to know your relationship is becoming toxic. And as always, this is an educational project sponsored by Google. Joining me today is one of my good friends and colleagues, you might remember her from last week's video, as well as our many various videos together, Dr. Alexa Altman. She is a licensed psychologist and trauma specialist. I know we talked about this a little bit um, previously, but why do you think that we thrive on relationships or we're social creatures? People talk about it all the time, but why do you think that is? Well, as mammals, and we're wired for love, belonging, and connection, and part of why we thrive in it is it regulates our nervous system, it regulates our psychological system, that we feel alive, we feel a sense of purpose, we feel a sense of identity when we're in a relationship with other people. Hmm. So it's almost like our whole reward system is lit up in a way, mm -hmm. and it only benefits us, so of course we're gonna seek it out. When it's positive. Mm -hmm. Of course. <laughs> or at least when the positive outweighs the negative of the interaction. And with that in mind, what are some traits of a healthy relationship then? Because mm -hmm. we're talking about like how it can be so good for us, but we know it can be bad. But how do we know if it's good? Like what are some of the positive traits or good traits we should look for? Yeah, so most of what we're looking for is a sense of feeling respected and understood and that there's cooperation or balance of power, or at least equitable power, mm -hmm. that there isn't someone on top and the other on the bottom. I think also we're looking at a division of labor, that we feel like we're both contributing to the relationship, both contributing to the daily tasks of, if you are living with a person, of what it means to cooperate. It's kind of like the five love languages a little mm -hmm. bit. <laughs> we can get some like physical touch, mm -hmm. we can get some words of affirmation, mm -hmm. we can share. Yep. Shared activities. Yeah. Right. I think, too, when you say that, it's not like you have to hit all the marks. No. But you have to hit enough of them that there's a sense of, again, the positive parts of that giving and taking outweigh the negative. Yeah. And so with that in mind, then, what are some signs that something's turning toxic? Because mm -hmm. I, I talk a lot about toxic relationships mm -hmm. and red flags. What can people kind of look out for? I mean, I know I have some in mind myself, but yeah. I'd be more interested to hear from you. So I think some of the things you're looking out for is really like poor play, <laughs> mm -hmm. where there's a lot of criticism, contempt. John Gottman talks a lot about that being mm -hmm. like the biggest wreck of any relationship is moments of extreme contempt in a relationship and criticism. And what to define contempt? contempt. Mm -hmm. What does that look? You know, it's like, why do you always look at me that way? You know, I can't believe you're doing that again. It's just really more of a negative style that we are hardwired for a negativity bias to begin with, but that we're kind of searching and scanning the environment for negative attributes or negative behaviors in the other. Gotcha, versus looking for the positive. positive. Like, thank you so much for being on time. Thank you for spending time with me. Right. Yeah. Thank you for packing the kids' lunches. Mm -hmm. That acknowledgement, that ongoing gesture. Of yeah, care. so contempt is one of the red flags. I also think of like a red flag for me is when I feel completely drained mm -hmm. after spending time. It's not necessarily something they've done directly, but it's like the, mm -hmm. the engaging with them is so emotionally draining that mm -hmm. it's just not worth it anymore. Mm -hmm. And I guess that drain could look like resentment. Mm -hmm. It could like physically exhaust it. Totally. It could feel like, oh my gosh, what, how much longer do I have? Mm -hmm. So I think that that drain is absolutely there. I think too, when you find that when you walk away from the interaction, you go on and on in your head about every single thing that happened. Yeah. Like trying to figure out how you feel where there wasn't a sense of ease in the interaction. And relationships are supposed to, they're not always easy, but you're supposed to really walk away feeling a sense of Fulfillment. Yeah, you should feel good. Yeah. I feel like other relationships shouldn't, and it sounds bad to say it this way, like serve a purpose, because mm -hmm. it's not like, oh, people have to serve a purpose to mm -hmm. me, but it's more like it, we fill roles for each other, mm -hmm. and so therefore we serve purposes to one another, 
it's almost like back to our conversation in the previous video where you're talking about like the whole reason that we connect as a way of survival and kind of like tribal in nature. And so that still carries through. And so we kind of still need that and we might still crave it. And that's what can make relationships important and good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when I think about the sense of a toxic relationship is when you say that, it's like if you're walking away from the experience and you're feeling emotionally or physically off center, I think one of the best things to do in those moments is actually to inquire with like a neutral safe person about your feelings. Sometimes it's hard to sort out exactly what is going on and why. Because often that toxic relationship can be subtle. It doesn't, Definitely. doesn't we've talked about this before, mm -hmm. it doesn't always start off that way. Yeah, it can start as like, um, it can be fine and dandy and perfect at mm -hmm. the beginning. And then all of a sudden it can start, there can be those little bits of contempt mm -hmm. or passive aggressive behavior. Mm -hmm. And it slowly turns into, it's almost like, I like to think of, and this sounds really bad to say it this way, and I don't mean that people are like illnesses, mm -hmm. but I like to think of toxic relationships more like a virus mm -hmm. versus like a car crash. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great way to think about it because I think sometimes people will look back after and say, mm -hmm. why didn't I see all those red flags? Totally. Oh my gosh, I have this huge sense of shame about it. But I'm like, really? If you think about it like your virus example, it happens so slowly over time and that we adapt sometimes to a person's style yeah. without even fully being conscious of it. And then when we finally become conscious of it, then you know, it's like all of a sudden, then how do we even move into action mm -hmm. to potentially end the relationship? or shift things. Totally, and I think that's the difficult part then is like moving into how do we either A, try to save a relationship that might be toxic, mm -hmm. or B, how do we end it? Mm -hmm. and, and I think a lot of people struggle to figure out, even personally I struggle to figure yeah. out where that line is. And I think the tricky thing when it comes to toxic relationships, like you said, there's a lot of shame associated with it. And you know, it, since it is kind of more like a virus, it moves on slow and we don't even notice maybe the symptoms, but everybody outside seems to know. Mm -hmm. It's like we've all ended relationships, whether they're romantic or not. And when you do, people are like, oh, thank God, I hated that person. <laughs> and it, it, like, it almost like compounds the embarrassment or shame or the struggle to talk about it. Correct. And it's like, why do you think we can't see it? Well, I think your virus analogy was really good because it happens so slowly and insidiously that I think we just accept each symptom of it and just maybe we're not even sure that it's coming from the relationship until that moment, right? And I think part of, I would say, anyone who feels like they might be in a toxic relationship, to actually populate it a little bit with safe, trusted others mm -hmm. to get their perspectives, because people more often are not gonna give their perspective on your relationship. Like, I will never forget. I remember I had a friend in college who had this horrible boyfriend who we knew was cheating on her, and I took it upon myself because I was the closest friend of the people who knew to talk to her about it and be like, you have to break up with him. And I lost that friend for like a year until she finally decided to break up with him and then came back around. So right. I think a lot of people do hold their tongue for fear of ruining a relationship or alienating that person. So it can be really tricky. It can be so tricky and I think too that inquiry and, and having somebody shed just a little bit of awareness oftentimes is the beginning of what feels like a deep sense of awareness of this is the full impact that this person has had on me. Yeah, and I like that, like talking about it, how people outside may notice, but then all of a sudden we'll have like a precipitating event mm -hmm. where it like shakes us to our core, it pushes us past what's mm -hmm. comfortable, and that's when we realize it. And I think then when we look back, because we, we have these new set of eyes now, and then we look back and we're like, oh my God, oh my God, there were all of these things, and it makes us feel even more stupid or, you know, like naive. Right, I, I think that's the, the key piece is that you start to retell the narrative of the story. And if I think about it, you know, we start relationships, people present their best self, any relationship, whether it's a romantic relationship, friendship. So we do kind of fall in love when yeah. we get into relationships. So I think we do bypass all those red flags as a way to feel really good. Totally, kind of back to the, like our other conversations about re releasing oxytocin and it feeling good in our, our brain and our bodies almost like rewarding us for it. So of course we're just like, oh, don't worry about that. We're, to, we're just moving quickly through this relationship more comfortable. <laughs> and then boom, sometimes you run into a wall. Not always, but Not sometimes. Always. And if you think about it, in all relationships, you do have to bypass certain quirks and certain things in order to be bonded to people. We of all course. have to accept that we're, you know, we're imperfect, perfect, we're different. Idiosyncrasies, things like that. Yeah. So I think in the beginning sometimes it could be like, well, it was just this one time, or mm -hmm. hmm, maybe that person was a little off that day. And that's normal. And so I think it's really the collection 
of you start to get like a profile, yeah, a big sample. Totally, and that's what usually, that's why it takes a few years sometimes, and then all of a sudden you come to head like into this big event or this thing or something they said, there's that precipitating event, and like um, almost like the rose colored glasses are thrown off and we're like, oh my God, you know, and then we don't really want to necessarily talk about it because then we feel like it was our fault. Mm -hmm. That's where the shame comes in. And sometimes people come into my office and their presenting issue is I'm really depressed. And they're not linking it at all to at all. That awareness isn't there yet. They're not linking it to the relationship. Or I'm so anxious and I don't really know why. And so they're thinking, this is my problem, this is my issue. I think I have a depressive disorder. And then we peel it back and we're really looking at, well, let's look at all of the relationships, all the pr things that are might be precipitating this depressive episode. Mm -hmm. And then you often, not always, you'll see, oh wait, this toxic relationship is actually having incredible ill effects on your psychological health. Yeah, which I think, that's why I like the virus analogy because mm -hmm. it, it like kind of takes over everything. It can mm -hmm. change or color all of the views mm -hmm. that you have about something. Mm -hmm. So if someone does find themselves in a toxic relationship, as we all have been, Yes. I'm not free from it either. I would say me too. You take an honest first look. Mm -hmm. I would say take an honest first look at, you know, I look at every pain point in life as an opportunity to for self-reflection. It's not about really blaming the other. They might have a piece that they're responsible for. I take a personal inventory and assess what was my contribution to this, not from a place of blame and shame, but really what did I learn about myself in getting into this experience with this person. A really good friend of mine mentioned this years ago and it's just stuck with me because it really resonated with what we're talking about. And she was saying that like, just because it's toxic doesn't mean one person's responsible. Like mm. it was that person or this person, it could just be a bad recipe. Mm. Like together you poke buttons right. and bring out the worst in each right. other. And right. I've definitely had relationships like that. Right, I think too, it's really interesting you say that because they think there's no villain. You don't, there's no mm. one to blame. And sometimes I think there's seeds of wisdom, pearls of wisdom, really, if you really want to assess the relationship from that perspective, not to find fault in yourself or the other person, but an opportunity for self-reflection. And I think a lot of times we like a villain, like we want to mm. find someone to blame. And so my like my first word of advice is if anybody finds themselves in something, in some sort of relationship structure that feels somewhat toxic, or it could be completely toxic, is instead of trying to figure out who's to blame, mm. looking back at your own role and what you can take from that to either build and heal that relationship or what to look for in new relationships going forward. Because mm -hmm. that's really been the most benefit for me. Right, and I think it brings the power back into your own hands of I participated in some way in this and I can participate in getting out of it and participate in a healthy attachment. Totally. A healthy relationship. So how do you decide, because this is kind of tricky, I have to think about it even for myself, how do you decide when to try to repair the relationship or when to cut it off. I think repair skills in and of itself is a skill mm -hmm. and not an easy one. No. So we think these are probably one of the hardest conversations we have. Like I was thinking about the times in which I've had to repair personally. Um, I go in always with a sense of like just a process. I like to write everything out, all of my feelings, what I'm learning, discovering about myself. I never blame the other person. I just really want to look at my role and what I think, my hypothesis about mm -hmm. what I think happened. So I always start with like an attempt for repair because if I can repair, I'd like to do that. And then what, I usually, what I've done is I gather data about how that went. Was that productive? Is the person open to that? Is that person seeking for the same kind of understanding and self-reflection that I am? Are they wanting to grow as a result of what's happened? Or are they wanting to blame me or write me off or name call or whatever that might be. And so for me, after I gather that data, that for me is like, is this person capable of repairing with me with the way that I choose to try to repair? And I have a very similar process where I'll always go in trying to repair mm -hmm. and I'll have done my own self-reflection. I do write mm -hmm. things out, not always, mm -hmm. but I love to, something about, it's like cathartic writing. I write pen and paper, not like typing it. It has mm -hmm. to be like that feeling of right, writing direct. it. And so I'll do that and then it, you're right, like if they're coming with the same open like approach to try to repair or if they're coming to fight. And if they come to fight, then that's always a signal to me that like, maybe I can come back around to this relationship later. I believe people can grow and change. That's like what we do for a yes. living. We have to, we, we have have to believe change. <laughs> exactly. And so if, <laughs> if they want to come back and apologize or try to make amends, I'm always open to that. Mm -hmm. But at that point, I'm like, okay, this is no longer serving me. This isn't going to work. There's no repair mm -hmm. to be had today. I have to walk away. I like that today because I think it can be really devastating to end a relationship. Yeah. And you can say, I need to end it now. 
and maybe with some time and some self-reflection, there might be an opportunity to come back. Yeah, totally. Because I don't, I don't like to think unless it's like abusive or dangerous. Right. I don't like to think of, um, you know, ending something that's toxic as being a final. It's, it's the end all be all. It's like that chapter's done, boom. Um, because I don't like to write people off, but I do like to think that people can change and grow. And if we grow in the same direction, we're able to come back together. I'm glad you said that because we're not at all talking about emotional or physical abuse. No. Right? That, that, Very that, separate. That's a separate issue where I say, you need to leave. There's no, please do not try to repair that. If somebody's crossed that line, do not go back in hoping for self reflection. This is a more kind of virusy kind of talk. <laughs> yeah, this is like passive about. aggressive behavior. Right. Mm -hmm. um, what I like to call like the black hole where mm. they just suck all the energy out mm. of you or where you just find mm. yourself fighting, bickering for no reason. Right. Or, um, Even like some gaslighting. Like totally. I think too, where they change, you know, your sense of your own reality. They mm -hmm. change the narrative and you think I'm, the way you're understanding and remembering is not at all the way I remembered it. Where yeah. your realities are so far apart. Yeah, because then it's hard to come back together. Yeah. But I do think that there is, for those relationships, there's room to heal. But if it's abusive in any fashion, it is not okay. And there, that's, we have to just, you know, think of safety first. So when it comes to our relationships and how we engage with other people, are there ways that you can see burnout affecting them directly? Yeah, so some of the telltale signs of burnout are physical and psychological exhaustion, cynicism. So like mm -hmm. just really having a negative viewpoint in your relationships, in your life, kind of that negativity bias. But also your sense of confidence and self-efficacy is dramatically reduced, your self-esteem. So I think about that, like if you're in a state of that burnout and those kind of three telltale signs, of course it's gonna impact your relationship. You're exhausted. So some of the three telltale signs of burnout are exhaustion, physical and psychological. It's even, I would say, spiritual exhaustion. And cynicism, just having a real negativity bias towards your own life, towards your situation, whether that's at work or in the home, in the relationships that you're in. Your self-esteem, that it starts to erode your sense of efficacy and competence in, let's say, at work. Yeah. in a relationship. So I think about that and how could it not carry through into your home life or into all of your relationships? You're exhausted. It even could look like depression where that social engagement system is really depleted. Just when you said that, it makes me think of like HALT, mm -hmm. the like acronym we use in DBT, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. And if mm -hmm. any of those things are off, you're, um, you're not as able to emotionally regulate. Mm -hmm. So in a way, you can be explosive without mm -hmm. recognizing it just because, I mean, think about it. If I'm hungry mm -hmm. and I'm really tired, mm -hmm. I'm not the person you want to be around. Correct, like you're kind of are like a low grade grumpy. Exactly, and then that anger component comes in mm -hmm. and if no one's there, we don't mm -hmm. feel supported, we feel lonely. Right. I mean, all those things compile, it would just be like, a, you're just like a mind waiting to right. explode. You're kind of misreading a lot of social cues too. Mm -hmm. And ex like you said, exploding or withdrawing and that, and, and you might again, not necessarily connect it with this experience of burnout. Totally, because we might not even recognize that that's what's happening. Yeah. We just like, you know, have a shorter fuse. Mm -hmm. and we want to fight with people more. Mm -hmm. And we probably think everybody's just so annoying. Mm -hmm. And it's right. them, not us, because we haven't, we don't have the time because we're working so hard. That's why we're burnt out. We don't really have the time to go back and be like, oh, no, it's me. Because that time mm. of self-reflection isn't not there. there. It's almost like the neocortex, the part that is engaged for self-reflection when you're so dysregulated, I know we've talked about this before, it's not really online. So what do you do? How do you do that? How do you yeah. do that when that self-reflective like muscle, even though it's not a muscle, isn't engaged? Yeah. I like a big inventory that writing out all the things that are present, that you're aware of that are stressful, and specific, get as specific as you can, like not just my boss, right? Yeah, or work. <laughs> work, right. Be as specific as you can, like what about that relationship with your boss or what about the workload or what about the culture of the company that you're in specifically mm -hmm. is stressing you out. And what I like about it, I would do that in every, actually every area of your life, but if it's specific to one work, you know, you could start there, not to be overwhelmed with every area. And then I like to think about, you know, part of what happens when we're burnt out is we don't feel like we're in charge, like our life is overwhelmed, it's kind of taken over. So I like to write next to those different items of inventory, what is it that I can do to modify or at least have a little bit of control over the situation. Yeah, what, what's the component I can control? Because I think a lot of times when we're feeling really burnt out or overwhelmed, we f we inadvertently focus on what we can't control. Right. And that just makes us feel like we're spiraling. Correct. Right? And so if it's easier, 
I think it's more beneficial to focus on what we can actually change and control. Right, and even if you think, wait, this is such a small thing, I think part of what's so impactful even about that small thing is that we're just mobilizing for our own care and for our own well-being. And so just even mobilizing in that direction, even if it feels like, well, this is an inch and I need a mile, I was like, but that's how momentum builds and that action towards your own care. Because burnout can obviously affect our relationships and affect how we engage with the world around us, what are some things, I guess kind of self-care tools, mm. like ways to better manage our mental health so that it doesn't affect our relationships, negatively affect our relationships? Mm -hmm. I think some of the things I think about with respect to self-care is really focusing on the relationships that you get the most support from mm -hmm. and really reaching out more often and frequently not necessarily just through, you know, talk about this, not just through text, yes, but really actually having some phone conversations, making time for yourself, making time to be creative. I think one of the things that research shows is like in, investing more in passion. So let's say you're really burnt out in the workforce and you, well, why not invest some of your energy outside of work? Doesn't necessarily fix your work situation in creative outlet. Yeah. I started pottery, right? Mm -hmm. So I think part of that was just to restore a sense of creativity and passion. Yeah, I like that you mentioned that because I think people assume that in order to repair or stop the burnout from happening, they have to do something directly for that. Mm -hmm. Like, I have to fix work. But often it's actually something we can do just to increase our reward mm -hmm. because burnout occurs because the reward for what we've done isn't at least equal to the effort we put in. Mm -hmm. But that reward can be received from, I took a personal date with myself and I went and like recharged my batteries and I got to go to a museum or I got to connect with a friend. I got to pet animals, I got to go for a walk, whatever it is that fills you up. It's like we still have to do that because then that kind of boop, like bumps our reward up mm -hmm. enough so that the effort doesn't outweigh it. Yeah, when that you said sense? that, I almost thought of like a tank, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, the burnout's essentially like you're on fumes or beyond that. Mm -hmm. And you're right, it doesn't have like the idea of whatever it is that fills your tank, you need to discover what that is for yourself again. And I think too, when you're really at the bottom of the exhaustion where there's no energy, it can feel, or just super depressed around it, it can feel like, I don't even, like, how do I even find my passion again? Yeah. So I like to go super historical. Well, what did you like to do when you were a kid? What used to light you up and get you like out on Saturday morning when school was out? Yeah, barely can sleep in, right. you're so excited. <laughs> right. Yes, totally. Right, you kind of have to find your childlike wonder again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that there's a lot of healing in that. And I mm -hmm. think that that's really, the goal of repairing from burnout or even just help like caring for our mental health mm. starts with that seed of like mm. what it is that feels good to you what what heals you mm. what's made you joyful in the past mm. can how can we make more time for that now mm -hmm. yeah i think thinking about our mental health is the same way we think about our physical health our spiritual health our financial health it does require a bit of effort mm -hmm. you know we don't just come in especially in this day and age feeling balanced. We actually have to work for that balance. Some of the people that I admire most have disciplines, I call it like rituals of self-care, yeah. that they are completely devoted to. So it's an ongoing effort. Thank you so much for taking the time again. I know that I learned a lot and I hope that you all did too. That was so interesting and a wonderful reminder to be grateful for those healthy, loving relationships and also to be careful and a bit more thoughtful about who we get into relationships with. Also remember that we strive and thrive on relationships because it's a survival mechanism and part of being human. We are more likely to survive in groups and that's why we are hardwired to connect with others. That's also why it's so important that we take care of ourselves and our mental health. Because as you know, we can't give to others if we don't have enough for ourselves first. If we don't pay attention to our own mental health and any symptoms of burnout we may be experiencing, we can inadvertently harm those relationships that mean the most to us. And your homework for this week is, consider, what are some of your most valuable relationships? Why is that? And even more importantly, what do you look for in a partner or friend? Take some time to consider what traits you believe are most important and write those down so that you know what you should consider when starting any relationship. And let's get those conversations going in the comment section down below. Did Alexa and I leave out any red flags or things that we need to look out for? What do you think is important in relationships? Please talk about it in the comments below because you never know who you could help. Thank you so much for tuning in and I will see you next week.
So I have taken time off. I've had felt uh, burnout like throughout my experience and throughout my time. And um, I, I think the first thing is like, I'm still, I think we all are works in progress. And um, you know, I don't know if I'm getting it fully right.